So now let's move into our study as we've been working over this last month in this series called Generous Living. We're looking at the principles that relate to how a Christian is expected to live generously, not with just our money, but the generosity of our lives. We're looking at four basic principles that are represented in this concept of generous living. Now I have to pause and tell you, this morning I was talking to a family who's here visiting. They happened to be visiting from one of the western suburbs and said, when we were starting this series and they decided they're going to come for the whole series and drive in. So I've decided to expand this series to about four months. And <laughs> so one way or another, you know. But these are the four principles. And we've already looked at two of them. Today we're at the third. It starts with thinking about life differently because from birth, our culture programs us to believe that our money is our own. We earned it. We can spend it any way we want. My first priority in life is to take care of my needs and my happiness and my future security. And we saw in that first study that everything that the Bible teaches us about our possessions and resources is completely opposite from the teaching of our culture. And if you didn't get a chance to see that, I encourage you to go back and watch it. Last week, the second principle that we were looking at was learning how to overcome the obstacles to generosity. And there are challenges when God calls us to give. And we need to know how to overcome those obstacles so that we can live generously. Now, in those first two studies, we really didn't even focus on the issue of money. It's just a, it's a principle of life, how we are to live and think generously. But today we're coming to the third principle, and this is the first time we're just going to hit this hit issue of actual financial giving head on. And the third principle is give to God first. Give to God first. We've all heard of the Kraft Cheese Organization, the Kraft Cheese Company. It was started by a man named James Kraft, who was a devoted follower of Jesus. And it's so interesting, as you read his biography, you find out that in his commitment to the Lord and giving back to God, he actually gave about 25% of his income back to the Lord on a regular basis. And it was such an interesting quote that I wanted to share it with you when Kraft said, the only investments I ever made which have paid constantly increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. Pastors will do their greatest service in leading their men to understand the truth of God concerning the stewardship of time and money. If Kraft was writing that today, he would include women. But at his time, he was speaking to the breadwinners. Today, our families have a predominance of a two-income family. And so Kraft would say, whether it's a man or a woman, if you're earning an income, the greatest value is when a pastor teaches you God's expectation for giving back to God. Now, you're going to hear that phrase throughout the entire study here this morning. You're not giving to Steve Miller. You're not giving to Village Church. Ultimately, every one of us are giving back to God. And when we have that understanding that we're giving back to God, then the overarching principle that we're going to understand this morning is that one of the clearest teachings in the Bible regarding generous living is that we must, as Christians, be generous with God before any other form of giving. Now, that almost sounds startling to us, to say that we must be generous with God in our giving before any other form of giving and generosity occurs. You might say, Steve, that's a little blunt, isn't it? I mean, where do you find that? Over and over. The principles of Scripture teach us this. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, and remember, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is a distinction between laws and principles. Laws are when God says, this is exactly what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to live it out. But principles 
apply regardless of the time period or dispensation in which God's covenant people are interacting with him. And so the principles of Proverbs 3 are just as applicable for the church today as they were for the Old Testament saints during the Mosaic period or even pre-Mosaic period of the Old Testament. And Solomon writes this principle to a culture that is far more agricultural than commercial and industrial and business oriented like we live in. But the principle still applies. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. And then as you honor God, God will honor you. Your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And so as Solomon is writing to people who are basically farmers, he's saying the first fruits, the first crop, the part of the crop that comes, you're supposed to give that to God before anything else. And it would be easy for us to say, okay, well, I've got, I'm growing apples, I'm growing something else, and I'll give him the first fruits, but I'm going to kind of give him the smaller ones instead of the bigger ones. And when you go to the book of Exodus 23, it becomes even more specific. You don't just give the first fruits, you give the best of the first fruits. Far too many of us give God the leftovers, the scraps, the stuff that we don't think we need or want. Okay, well, I'll give that part to God. And God says, no, you give the best of your first fruits. Jesus reaffirmed the importance of this principle of giving back to God first. When in, the sermon, in, in Luke chapter 12, he's telling this parable and it's all related to money. And he says, rather than storing up treasures for ourselves, and we find this same principle taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But in the Luke version of this, Jesus is saying, rather than storing up treasures for yourself, here we are as a first priority to be rich toward God. In Luke 12, 21, he says a person is a fool, and that is a strong word, a fool. But the New Testament use of the word fool doesn't mean somebody who's intellectually stupid, somebody who is naive or uninformed, but it is, there is a moral quality to this. You are a fool in the biblical sense if you make decisions in your life based on a material or worldly concept rather than a spiritual perspective that God gives us in his word. And a person is foolish to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with or toward God. Jesus is saying the first priority of your life should be to honor God with your wealth. All right, so let's, I'm going to be straightforward all the way through this. Let's just look at this chart. On this chart on the screen, this chart represents every one of us. And not somewhere on this continuum, each one of us fall in terms of our giving back to God. If we start over at number one, there are many of us, in fact, half of Christians don't give anything to God. That's statistically current. Half of Christians don't give anything to God or they just give occasionally, number two. Number three represents, well, I give when I'm at church. If I have a five or 10, I'll throw something in the basket or the plate. I give when I'm at church, but then when we move to number four, I tithe, and the word tithe represents a tenth of our income. And as you study through the scriptures, I think that that's the baseline that God is looking for in our lives. Some would say, well, that's just Mosaic law. No, it's not actually. It's pre-Mosaic as you study the lives of the patriarchs. Jesus affirms the importance of teaching in his teaching about giving tithes. I think that that's where we start as believers and that's the minimum that God is looking for. I tithe when I'm at church. Now, if I'm not at church, maybe I'm not gonna give then. But then we move to the next point, number five, I tithe each week, whether I'm there or not. And can I just be honest and say, that's what I love about the online automatic giving because there are weeks all of us are gone, something's going on and we may not be there and it's so easy to let it slip. I love the fact that when I'm giving automatically online, God immediately gets the first fruits, the best 
of my income, and it's always going to be consistent. It, some people complain and say, oh, but that takes all the personal worship out of it when you write a check. Most people don't even have checkbooks today, all right? And I don't even have to think about it. I've already decided and predetermined God gets the best. God gets the first fruits of my income, and it's going to be consistent whether I'm there or not. And I love that option for us in our culture today. Number six is not only do I want to give regularly and consistently, but when God gives me other opportunities to demonstrate generosity, I want to be ready for that too. And so let me just ask you to be honest with yourself and say, where are we at right now in our giving back to God? What number would you be at? Understand this, friends. God calls every Christian to give back to him. Now, this is not for believers. And if you're here today as a guest and you're not a believer, thank you for being here. But this, this message is a family message. This is for believers only. God is communicating his expectations for us as his children. God calls every Christian to give back to him as a reflection, number one, of our love, our gratitude, number three, our trust, number four, our desire to help build his kingdom. And this is expected of believers. It's expected. God's the one who set this up. But what's so interesting is while this is expected of believers, God also promises to bless and honor our giving in return. God says, you honor me and I'll take care of you. Now, when it comes to this issue of not giving back to God, it's so interesting. There are four major excuses that people give for why they don't give back to God. The single most common reason that people say, I can't give to God is because I can't afford it. I can't afford it. And let's be honest, we live in a culture right now where the economy is in, in a wreck. We've seen that over the last couple of years. My word, you have to be wealthy beyond imagination just to get a dozen eggs. I mean, who could have ever imagined? Almost $5 for a dozen eggs. And we live in that kind of economy. And it affects all of us. It really does. In fact, to give you a kind of a snapshot of where our culture is in terms of the economy, inflation, and all the rest of it, did you know that the average American, this is current just in the last couple of months statistics, the average American has four credit cards and most of them are maxed out. The average adult in America, 21 and above, the average debt is $90,000. And this is how it breaks down. Ages 18 to 23, they're about 10,000 in debt. Millennials, 24 to about 40 years old, are 78, almost $80,000 in debt. Gen Xers, which are 40 to 55, are $135,000 in debt. I was amazed when I saw this. Baby boomers from 56 to 74 are still almost $100,000 in debt. And it's not until you get a above 75 years old, that your indebtedness average drops to only $41,000. That's a lot of debt that we're carrying. Just the idea of having kids, think of what it costs today. And this is a current statistic. The cost of raising a single child from birth to 18 is $310,000 now. Wow. Wow. I am giving a bill to all of my kids. <laughs> Trust me. Who can even afford to get married anymore? I mean, it's just crazy. It was so interesting this week as I was preparing for this. I ran across this little poem that I thought I'd share with you. It's so it kind of characterizes everything we're talking about. The bride bent with age, leaned over her cane, her steps uncertain, need guiding, while down the church aisle with a long toothless smile came the groom in a wheelchair gliding. And who is this elderly couple thus wed? You'll find when you've closely explored it that this is that rare, most conservative pair who waited till they could afford it. <laughs> We live in a world with mountains of debt. And this is the most common reason that people give for not being able to give back to God. 
Right next to that, and I'm sorry to say this is the second most common reason, I just don't want to give back to God. It's my money. I can do whatever I want with it. And there's a sense of greed that comes through in this issue. I just have things I want to do with it, and God, not even God's going to tell me what to do. Now, that is a tragic reason, but number three, right behind it, while it may sound a little softer, well, I would give to God, but right now, and someday I plan to, but right now I have other priorities. I want to pay off my house. I want to buy a car. I need a few more of the toys for the house and all that other stuff that goes on. And the person is saying, I don't, it's not that I hate God or I don't want to be involved in kingdom building or giving back to him, but just right now, it's not a convenient time in my life. And this is kind of like the old thing that a person who won't read is no better off than a person who can't read. The result is still the same. You may not have the harsh attitude that says, I don't want to give to God, but the net effect is still the same if you're saying, I'm just not ready someday. Because the reality is that for people who say, number three, I have other priorities right now, there will always be other priorities. Always. And then the last reason that people give for not giving back to God in the church is, I don't like what happened in the church. I don't like the decisions that the elders made about something. I don't like what the pastor said in that sermon. And I am going to register. And we call this voting with your wallet. And so people withhold their giving and they think, now that's going to make the church realize how dissatisfied I am. And the unfortunate reality of that is they misunderstand when you're giving, you're not giving to the pastor. You're not giving to the church. Ultimately, you're giving back to God. And if you say, well, I don't like what the church did. I don't like that decision. I don't like something that happened. I'm not going to give to the church. What you're really saying is, I don't like what the church did, so I'm going to not give back to God. And that has serious consequences for believers. Because God calls us to a life of generosity to him, to be rich toward God in our giving. In fact, this is so serious that when in the Old Testament, God's covenant people, and we are God's covenant people now in the New Testament era, but when God's covenant people didn't like what was happening in their lives or they had other priorities and they stopped giving. In the book of Malachi chapter three, God gave, came to them and said very specifically, are you gonna rob from God? If this money belongs to him and you keep it, are you gonna rob from God? And you ask, well, how are we robbing God? And God answers in your tithes and offerings. When you stop giving your tithes and offerings, God says, listen, you're under a curse. There's a judgment because you're stealing from me. You're not stealing from the church. You're not stealing from the pastor. You're not stealing from the elders. You're not stealing. You're stealing from me. That's pretty serious. God calls his covenant people to give to him first. First and to give him the first fruits of our income. Folks, understand this. This is so critical. God's plan to support the work of the local church is for every believer, not every attender, because every, some attenders aren't even saved yet, right? This is a family discussion. God is dealing with us as his children, his covenant people. And God's plan for the supporting of the local church is when every believer gives a portion of their income to meet the needs of their home church's total ministry. Their home church's total ministry. When you looked at that chart that had the continuum of giving, where did you land? On the one, two, or three side where you don't give or only occasionally give? Maybe you were on the other side, the four, five, and six, and that's great. You give regularly, you tithe, you support the work of the kingdom in village church. But can I ask you to be honest? And If everybody gave back to God the same way that you give back to God, how would that impact the ministry of our church. Now, if you're one of those 
four or five or six number people and you're committed to giving back to God and you say, wow, this is, a, this is an important spiritual value in my life. That would be incredible. Think of what our church could do if everybody were committed to giving back to God on a regular basis and being generous with God. That we would be able to have a ministry that is just unbelievable. But if you're one of those people who are on the one, two, or three side, I only occasionally, if at all, give back to God. And everybody in our church family gave like you give. How long could our church even exist? Seriously. How would we be able to have missionaries? How would we be able to pay our mortgage or the utilities? How would we even be able to have a staff? And some, well, I give back to God, but I send it to somebody else's ministry. Joel Osteen, David Jeremiah, somebody else. I give, but I give to, uh, instead of supporting our own local church. But can I be honest and say, if something happens in your family and somebody's at the hospital, are you going to call Joel Osteen? <laughs> Seriously, are you going to call David Jeremiah? Is, are they going to be there? If you want a church family, then we need to support with our family income. It's no different than a husband and wife, whether you have one income or two income home, and you have a paycheck, and you depend on that paycheck in order to survive. Can you imagine a husband coming home one week, and the wife says, okay, I need the paycheck, and he says, well, I don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? Well, I gave it to somebody else. What? We have bills. We have a mortgage. We have lights and electric, all the rest of it. Or if the wife is, if they're dependent on the wife, and... She comes home and the husband says, okay, I need your check. She says, well, I went and bought clothes today instead. I don't have the money. And you can, how does a family exist and continue meeting their needs if the income isn't there and both are responsible to contribute? And the same reality hits the local church. If people don't give back to God as God calls us to do, how is the church going to continue to be in here to minister to the needs of your family? We just have to be honest about this, okay? So if God calls us as believers to give a portion of our income back to him, how do we do that when we have these obstacles of giving and all of these excuses that are so natural for us? God says, if you are going to give back to me, this ought to reflect four qualities or spiritual values that are a part of your life that will then make giving back to God so much easier. The first one is our giving is a reflection of our love for God. The second is our giving is a reflection of our gratitude or thankfulness to God. The third is a reflection of our trust in God. And then the fourth value is that our giving is a reflection of a heavenly vision and understanding that this life is not the end, that whatever we give to the Lord is like paying it forward because God's going to keep a score of everything that you and I have given so that he can bless us in heaven. And part of the rewards that the believer gets in the next life is based on how generous we are in giving back to God in this life. And so when we think in terms of our love for God, it's interesting, Wes Wilmer is the senior vice president of the Evangelical Free Church, our denomination, and in a book on stewardship, he writes and says, why stewardship and generous giving are the natural outcome. It's the natural outflow of a life that is devoted to God and Christ. It's a love thing. It's a love thing. In fact, Jesus makes this absolutely clear that our giving is not based on affordability or our likes or dislikes about what happens in the church or any other external. In Matthew chapter 6, as Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. But instead, store up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he ties this to the condition of our hearts. This is all a love thing. He says, wherever your treasure is, that's where the desires of your heart are going to be. If you treasure the things of earth more than the things of heaven, that's where you're going to invest your money. 
That's how you'll spend it. But if you treasure God and the things of heaven more than the things of the earth, then that's how you're going to focus. And to make sure that we get this, Jesus even pushes harder when he says, no one, absolutely no one can serve two masters. For either he's going to hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And are you ready? You cannot, you cannot serve both God and money. It's a love thing. It's a love thing. And it's always been a love thing. It's not just in our generation. D.L. Moody, hundreds, 150 years ago, D.L. Moody was dealing with the same issue in his generation that we're dealing with in ours. In fact, Moody said, where is our treasure? Is it on earth or in heaven? What are we doing? What is the aim of our lives? Are we just living to accumulate money or to get a position for our children? Or are we trying to secure those treasures which we can safely lay up in heaven and become rich toward God? It's a love thing. Rick Warren, years ago, wrote the book Purpose Driven Life. It is the most popular religious book but for unsaved people, it's more than just the devotional for Christians. This is the single most popular book that unbelievers have read. He tackles this head on the money issue and says it's a love thing. It's a love thing when he writes, money has the great potential to replace God in your life. More people are sidetracked from serving materialism than by anything else. They say, after I achieve my financial goals, then I'm going to serve God. Then I'm going to give to God. And that is a foolish decision. That is a foolish decision that they will regret for eternity. When Jesus is your master, money serves you. But when money is your master, you become its slave. And what decides who's master, whether it's money or Jesus? It's your heart. It's a love thing. So our giving back to God is a direct reflection of how much we love him. But our giving back to God is also a reflection of how grateful we are for the things that God gives us. And we saw this a couple of weeks ago. Even my ability to work is a gift from God. Everything that I have in my life is a gift from God. And it's so interesting, in Psalm 50, read the words that God is speaking through the psalmist. He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me. If you give thank offerings to God, he's honored by that. And God prepares the way so that I can show, the person by giving prepares the way so that I, God, can show him the, the salvation of God. Now, this is really important. Don't misunderstand this verse. It doesn't mean that as you give money to God, he will allow you to be saved. What, what God is communicating in this principle is that our giving reflects a heart for him and a gratitude for him that opens up the door for us to experience, enjoy, and understand all the blessings of our salvation that God has for us. And we're saying, okay, God, thank you so much for everything that you've given me. When I'm giving to the Lord, when I give back to God, I'm just saying, God, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Two weeks ago, we looked at this verse when we were talking about the fact that God gives us everything as God was telling David, okay, you're not gonna build the temple. Solomon will do it, but you get to bring all the resources together. And so David and all the leaders of Israel came and they gave and they saw so much. They were just overwhelmed by how much were people were giving. And David spontaneously said, yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. We saw that two weeks ago. But notice what we didn't see two weeks ago is the next verse. Now our God in our giving, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. My giving back to God is a direct reflection of how grateful I am. Now let's just be honest. Can I, 
we all have had moments when we've given something to somebody as a Christmas or birthday gift or some other reason that we gave them a gift, and you can tell the difference between somebody who's grateful and somebody who isn't. The person who's grateful, oh, thanks. Oh, this is exactly what I wanted. This is just what I needed. And we sense that gratitude, and it makes us want to give more. But we've also had those moments when we've given something to someone that wasn't appreciated. Oh, thanks. Yeah, this is really nice. And there is something in my head when I give something to a person who is unappreciative that says, why should I bother giving you anything any again? If you don't appreciate it, if it's not valuable enough to say even thank you. And if that's how we think, come on, let's be honest, that's how we think. If that's how we think, why should we expect that God is any different with his children? If we can't even say thank you through our giving, why should we expect that God is just going to keep pouring out blessing in our lives? Is that reasonable? Does that make sense? Right? So our giving is a reflection of our love. Our giving is a reflection of our thankfulness or gratitude. But then the third value is that our giving should be a reflection of our trust in God. By my giving... Because remember, the world teaches me and conditions me, you need to take care of this yourself. Your first priority is to take care of your needs, your happiness, and to provide for your future security. But God says, no, I'll take care of you if you're faithful to me. You can trust me. In fact, in that same passage in Malachi, where God says, if you're not giving to me, you're stealing from me, God also says, bring the whole tithe, bring your offerings into the storehouse, and that would have been the temple at that time, bring the whole offering into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And this is the only time in the entire Bible that God's covenant people are allowed to test him, to put him to the test. He says, test me in this, and it's directly related to money. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, one of the strongest names of God in the Old Testament. Test me in this and see if I'm not going to throw open the floodgates of heaven. That term floodgates of heaven is the same picture as what happened in Noah's flood. When God opened up the windows of heaven and poured out so much rain that it drowned the world. Now, God says, when you test me in this because of your faithful giving, I will open up the windows, the floodgates of heaven, and pour out so much blessing that you're not going to have enough room for it. Wow, man, that's the way I want to be blessed. All right, now, let me pause here because I get so upset. I absolutely, and there's no way I can say it strong enough, I absolutely despise the theology that's common in evangelicalism today called the wealth and prosperity gospel. Wealth and prosperity teachers are spiritually manipulative. And the whole idea is you give to get. And if you give to me, God will bless you 10 times, 100 times more. And that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I just call those guys snake oil salesmen. I mean, seriously, I, several years ago, I got a letter from a pastor in the church. He sent this letter out to everyone, four pages of this. And I just want to show you the highlights. I'm not going to mention the church's name or the pastor's name, but I want you to see this is how it works. The letter said, if you want to step into God's season of blessings and receive your prophesied double portion of blessing as we begin this new year on God's calendar, I need your sacrificial offering here on my desk by October 12th. This is the season which God decides whether he's going to judge or bless you. Who wants to be judged or cursed by God, right? You're going to get that check written. Time is running out for you to be part of this latter rain offering. So don't delay. If you want the most abundant blessings of God in double portion, give now. Your day of atonement offerings absolutely must be here on my desk by October 12th in order for your prayers to sit upon the altar so that I can pray over your needs and for your double portion of God's blessing. Send it today. It's just horrible, horrible theology, horrible manipulation. 
And before we look at them and say, oh yeah, those wealth and prosperity teachers, they're terrible. Listen, evangelical fundamental pastors are just as bad. Our theology may not be as bad, but our methodology is exactly the same at times. Warren Wiersbe, in his book, on his commentary on 2 Corinthians, Be Encouraged, wrote and said, during my years of ministry, I have endured many offering appeals. I have listened to pathetic tales about unbelievable needs. I have, this is Warren Wearsby. He said, I have forced myself to laugh at old jokes that were supposed to make it easier for me to part with my money. I have been scolded, shamed, and almost threatened. And I must confess that none of these approaches ever stirred me to give more than I planned to give. In fact, more than once I actually gave less because I was so disgusted by the worldly approach. Look, we shouldn't have to manipulate people. We shouldn't have to browbeat. We shouldn't have to make people guilted into this. God simply says, this is, this is my standard. This is my expectation. And this is what I'll do for you if you're willing to be faithful. And the Bible says that God is going to bless us when we do give. We don't have to be manipulative about it at all. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, give and you're going to receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, pour it out into your lap. And here's the standard that God uses to, to bless us. The amount that you give to God will determine how much you get back from God. End of story. Paul says exactly the same thing in 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously, and he's talking about money here. He's using another agricultural farming illustration. He says the one who plants generously is going to get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly. Don't give out of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. And God will generously provide everything that you need when you respond to him in generosity. And then you're always going to have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. For the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread for him to eat in the same way as the one who will provide and increase your financial resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. This is God's plan. He doesn't have to do it, but he promises, if you meet the needs of my house and you are generous in giving back to me, I'll generously provide for you. So how do we balance all that wealth and prosperity teaching with what the Bible actually teaches? And it's this. The spiritual motivation for giving is never, never that we give in order to get. But as we give in order to honor God, we also have the added assurance that God will honor our giving with return blessing. I can trust him. I can trust him. I can trust him. All right. So we're kind of running out of time here. Let me give you the fourth one, heavenly vision. My giving is a direct reflection of my understanding of heavenly vision. When Jesus said, don't store up treasures for yourself on earth. Moths are going to eat them. Rust will destroy them. Thieves are going to break in and steal. But instead, store up treasures in heaven. Everything that you and I give back to God. God keeps a ledger. And he says, this is how I'm going to bless you, not just in this life, but also the next. Now, this is speaking right where every one of us live. Our wallets are closely tied to how we think, how we live, what our spiritual values are. And when it comes to eternal values... David Gooding, I shared this with you two weeks ago. Heaven is scarcely a reality to the man who is not prepared to invest hard cash in it and its interests. But by the same token, heaven becomes more of a reality for the man who is willing to give back to God. It's that simple. There's lots of ways that we can do that. We can do it by giving back to God when we're at church or through the online giving. We can give back to God by including the church in our wealth. And by the way, do you remember that the whole reason we were able to get started on the building program 
was because one person who used to attend our church left us a half a million dollars so that we could start this program. What an incredible blessing to our church. You can give through donor advised funds, the special projects. You can give stocks and securities. You may not know, you can actually do that. Give churches stocks and securities as a way of giving back to God. Require them uh, minimum distributions. People in retirement years start to kind of distribute their resources. This is a great way to be able to give back to God. All right. Many of you know of John Ortberg, great pastor, author. He grew up and he wrote a book called When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. In this story, he writes about growing up playing Monopoly with his grandma. And they used to get so competitive as they played Monopoly and each one of them wanted park place, you know, the expensive ones. They would go at it full bore. But in the end, after it was all over, they knew everything's going back in the box and the next time we'll start over, right? But isn't it cool that it works exactly the opposite in our giving back to God? Nothing goes back in the box. It all goes ahead of us. And in my love, in my trust, in my gratitude, God says, Steve, you give back to me and there will be treasures waiting for you in heaven. Let me just jump to my last slide. And I want to present this challenge to you. Last week, I challenged you to look for an unplanned opportunity to demonstrate generosity. This week, I want to challenge you, if you're one of those people in slot one, two, or three where you don't give or only occasionally give, wherever you are, say, God, what is it that you want me to do to move forward in my giving back to you? Can I share this one last thought? And this has been a burden on my heart for 40 years now. My mom and dad taught me the value of tithing. When I, I had my first paper out when I was in third grade, and my mom and dad said, see, the first 10% goes to God. It belongs to him. And that was a value I've tried to follow throughout my life. But even more so, in maturity and understanding of how important this issue of giving back to God is, one day, every one of us are going to stand before the Lord. Every one of us who are believers are going to be in heaven. And one day when we get to heaven and see the nail-scarred hands of Jesus who gave all for us, when we see the millions of people who are there because of generous giving to kingdom outreach, and when we see the reward that God has prepared for us because of our giving back to him, I am absolutely, absolutely convinced that no matter how much we gave in this life, Every one of us are, are going to wish that we had given more. But our opportunities are done at that point. Now is the time that we choose. Now is the time that we give. And I hope that your giving back to God is a reflection of your love, your gratitude, your trust, and your heavenly vision. All right? Let's pray.